The information presented is for informational purposes only. The opinions expressed are not necessarily the opinions of any Daikin company. This information should not be confused for accounting, legal, medical, or other professional advice. Please seek advice from a qualified professional for any specific questions. Welcome to the Accelerated HVAC Success Program. My name is Ben Middleton. I'm the National Sales Training Manager for the Goodman Amana and Daikin Brands. Today, we're joined here with Gary Ellix. He is an entrepreneur and an industry expert. Gary, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it, Ben. Thanks for having me. It's nice to be here. So, Gary, as we start off each of these, I like to find out how in the world did you get roped into this industry we call HVAC? Yeah, 1983, I was graduating college at the Ohio State University. Probably got some Michigan fans out there. They're mm. probably not too happy about that. And I needed a job. And um, it was kind of the era of 8 9% interest rates, 10% unemployment. A lot of people don't really remember that because it's so mm -hmm. long ago. But um, I had a friend that played baseball with me, and he got a job at a company called Magic Chef Air Conditioning, which has now been absorbed long gone. And he's like, hey, do you have a job yet? And I'm like, no. So when I interviewed, they said, what do you know about air conditioning? And I said, nothing. I grew up in a house with a furnace, no air conditioning. <laughs> Again, we're talking about 1983, right. so it was before most of the air conditioning business really blossomed. And so uh, when I interviewed, the guy was a baseball fanatic. And so he took pity on me and he said, well, the <laughs> tall ones are the furnaces, the short ones are the air conditioners. You're hired, here's a price <laughs> book, go call on some distributors. And pretty much that was it. So I had no idea what air conditioning was, uh, no real understanding of the industry. And so that's, that was happy to have a job though at that point, so. So today, I mean, you've done a, just a ton of different things within the industry itself, but today you, have uh, equity in several HVAC companies. Yes. You also uh, do some consulting. Yep. Uh, you work with several of the best practice groups out there, and you also uh, do some marketing on the side. Yes. Tell yeah. me a little bit about all of these involvements in, in, in what you're doing in the industry today. Yeah. So, Ben, I got six operating companies. Mm -hmm. um, they all operate independently. So, EPC Equity invests, and I support the operations of HVAC, plumbing, electrical, solar, uh, those types of businesses. So, we're obviously a Daikin affiliated mm -hmm. contractor, DCP, and then we have the marketing agency businesses. So we do, you know, best practices in marketing. So we're traditional media, digital media across all spectrums there. And then on the side, I do some training and consulting. So I, I consider myself a paid assassin today. Okay. So you might say, hey, let's teach this class and we'll talk about what you need. And so we'll work with the contractors on best practices. So, so th that's the scope of work. There are, it's all trades related, though. Everything I do is tied back to HVAC, plumbing, electrical. And so we're also talking about getting into the roofing sectors these days. So um, good opportunities, I think, in that zone. So put on your contractor hat for a second here. Why Daikin? Well, very simply, the people. So for me, Daikin has great technologies, innovative business practices, uh, but we really relate back to the distributorships and the people that we do business with. Um, there's no substitute for that relationship. So you'll always have a great product. It's hard to beat the fit. It's hard to beat any of the technologies that you're doing, mm -hmm. R32, et cetera, as we move it forward. But at the end of the day, it's my relationship with the people inside the business. And so I can trust that. And to me, the relationship at the vendor level is about trust. I trust your product. I trust that you'll do the right thing. I trust that you're going to be focused on the, the business, the consumer. And so that relationship is, is built on the people. So for all of our contractors out there, and more importantly, probably for our territory sales managers, when you are looking to select a brand, that uh, point of contact that you have is the territory sales manager. Yep. What do you look at or what do you ask your managers of your different businesses to look for when selecting the right TSM to align with that specific brand that you're, you're looking for? That's a terrific question, Ben. It's, it's about bringing value to the relationship. Mm -hmm. So uh, a business like R.A. Nichols up in New York, New Jersey area, that's sort of a recent relationship for me. Um, this is a smaller company, I say smaller, three and a half million dollars, but you know, wants to scale to 20 million. So the relationship with the people there is gonna be different than, for example, a $50 million business that already has a lot of practices. So it's, it's mm -hmm. different. Um, what we need though, is we need the integrity of trust. So if Ben is my TM and he says, hey, I'm gonna do something, 
you know, we can trust that that's going to be done. Um, so if you, if you look at that, bringing value is different for each relationship. It's not just product training. It's not just bringing the technical expertise. It's bringing business relationships. It's being able to bring a marketing partner to the equation. It's making sure I know what meetings to go to. As a former TM, yeah. not every meeting <laughs> is a good meeting for a contractor. Right, right? So right. I used to have a deal with my clients, with, which was I'll tell you which ones you can't miss. And you have to trust me that you got to be there. And I'll tell you which ones that you probably should be. But, you know, if you can't make it, you got a family commitment or something, it's different. So having a TM that understands the nature of what we're trying to accomplish in our business plan is, is crucial. Um, so there's plenty of TMs out there that don't know how to do that. But my experience, you know, with the Daikin team is their TMs are just a cut above the rest. And that's just, you know, for us, that's important. Um, as the business scales... You know, now we need some different things. You know, now we need sales training. You know, we need mm. you involved in their teaching the technicians, you know, how to communicate, you know, how to talk about service agreements, how to make sure we know how to leverage a lead turnover, you know, different things that are just, right. I think, a, a different level of territory management than maybe, you know, sort of the guy that's just establishing a quote and saying, here, here's a good price. And so for us, it's not about the price. You know, I mean, we'll, we'll yell at you about the price if it's wrong. Every contractor in the United States will do that. <laughs> right. But it's not about being the lowest price. It's about being the highest value. Um, our Correct. profit matrix doesn't depend on your lowest price. It depends on the reliability and the equipment, lack of warranty calls, you know, the ability to train our guys to finish the work, et cetera. So for us, that's, that's what we want in a TM and a distributorship. So I believe it was Peter Drucker that said, what gets measured gets done. You betcha. And one of the things I know that you are passionate about is KPIs. You know, mm -hmm. Let's take a look at the scorecard. If you were talking to a contractor, if you were just coming out there, what would you say are the most critical KPIs that every single contractor should be tracking? Yeah, so we're going to jump to the assumption they have KPIs. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so the first question that I would ask is, hey, are you departmental? You know, do you have your service business broken down away from your installation business? And, and have we partitioned maintenance Mm. as a separate business from service, even though we might have the same technician doing that workflow. So so if we had three buckets, Ben, and we were there, you know, the next question is, well, that's on the sales line. Everybody sort of agrees. I want to know where I sold stuff. Right. And so the problem lies in KPIs where we don't break down the costs. So the matching principle in accounting is costs follow the revenues. Mm -hmm. So maintenance costs, maintenance uh, you know, issues should run through the income statement. Mm -hmm. based on the rep maintenance of revenue and services it is the same. So typically what I see, Ben, is most of those companies are broken down through the sales line and not through the costs line. So sure. cost of goods sold might get assigned in QuickBooks, but overhead rarely gets allocated. Mm -hmm. And um, honestly, there are coaches out there that say, don't, don't do it. And, you know, <laughs> for me, I, I'm the opposite of that. I'm like, well, you don't have to do it. It's your business. But if you want to know the cost of making a widget, I guarantee you Daikin knows what it costs to manufacture anything that they run through this incredibly fantastic building. Mm -hmm. Okay, they know, and we need to know, or we're not going to establish our pricing correctly. So that leads us to the KPIs. So once I have that piece of information, I can look at labor in the relationship to what's happening to gross profit dollars. Mm -hmm. So this is one of those metrics that we learned in the 90s, way back when, when we had the kind of the first consolidation wave that occurred, uh, that gross profit dollars are super important because that's what pays the bills. Um, revenue is great, but GP is how we produce the ability to you know, create a profit. And so our gross profit against our labor dollar, we want that to be a four to one ratio, six to one would be optimized. So if we're broken down in a financial statement and we can see those numbers, we can really get to it very quickly, like within seconds, you know, I can teach you as a business owner to say, hey, look at that number. And if that's not right, operationally, we got to dig in and figure out what we need to do differently. What are the levers? So that's a big KPI for me. Uh, conversion rates are always going to be important. Mm. I don't think there's a sales trainer on the planet. <laughs> uh, and I know you do business with lots of them. They would tell you that, hey, 42% is sort of the average in the trade. You know, if we can get that up to 60, that's very helpful. Um, so I'm always looking at conversions. Average tickets are important. That indicates pricing is set correctly. Um, so, you know, we have the top 10 KPIs, you know, so I mm -hmm. gave you sort of three of the top 10. So I always look at the top 10 KPIs, but it's super important that we're departmental. If we're not departmental, um, we're essentially making an Easter egg with all the colors inside of 
you know, the, 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 the box. Right. So it's going to turn out to be a black Easter egg, and we don't really understand, you know, which colors actually contributed to that. So we want to have all the primary colors separated. And that's the biggest advice I can give to anybody that's watching this. And that's probably more important today than I would say in any time in our recent history because we're coming off of a time when demand was super high. Yeah. And, and now we're coming back down to reality a little bit. Yeah. And there's going to be some companies that are, it's going to be painful for. Yeah. So I, I think as we are in that period where interest mm -hmm. rates are starting to creep up, obviously the Fed's doing Fed things. And so companies are going to see a slowdown. We already have in replacements. We came through COVID where we mm -hmm. actually, you know, we're the essential workers. So we actually right. were gifted, you know, great transaction models. Um, so, yeah, I, I, we're already seeing that, Ben. We're already seeing companies that are starting to see their business decline on the replacement side, which puts more pressure on your service. So it's a little bit like if you have a service business that's generating lead turnovers for your install group, but it's not a profitable service entity, you get away with it because the install covers up the sins. It's very profitable. When you start losing some of that traction in your install business and your service business is over there losing $20 every time you run a call, it's death by a thousand paper cuts. You start mm -hmm. getting into a cash flow uh, deficit and it's, it's painfully slow, but you get there and you don't understand why. So departmentalization keeps us from that, you know, making that happen. The second thing you want to be doing, I think, is on the marketing side, let's talk about how to grow the customer base. Mm -hmm. If I know that, you know, there's 20 people that are going to be in my marketplace for HVAC I used to sell 10 of them, and now I'm only going to sell five. Okay, the loss of those five people, that's a, that's a big hit to my gross profit. So I need 40 customers, not 20 now. And so now that number of 10 installations is back. So I need to expand my geographic zone for service, target market service, get my maintenance club agreement going. And that's how you sustain yourself in sort of this period of economics. Now, going back to my story of 1983, mm -hmm. We were in that period. So I came into the industry during that period. So I was trained to understand that from very early on that, hey, this is how you do it. And then obviously as the 80s and 90s, you know, um, what we saw was a very strong replacement curve during that era. And so we've, we've had that same replacement curve sort of from some 2015 to 2021 where interest rates were at zero. Uh, financing was pretty easy to come by. And so w we are now out of that period. So uh, I call it whitewater. We're in permanent whitewater right now. Sure. How have you seen, uh, you know, pricing obviously is a big thing. Mm -hmm. We've seen uh, just, you know, many price increases. Uh, the manufacturers have had those. We've seen inflation and everything. Yep. Uh, the grocery store homeowners are feeling it. And uh, a lot of HVAC contractors have historically priced their jobs off of some sort of a multiplier. Yes. And so that has impacted profitability for contractors using mm -hmm. those multipliers. But what are some of the dangers that you see with using a multiplier divisor method versus some of the other methods that are out there? Yeah, so um, I teach gross mm -hmm. profit dollars per man day. It's an important model. Um, I also teach dual overhead, which requires departmentalization. So if you're not departmentalized, dual overhead is kind of off the table. Um, so the question becomes, most companies are not uh, departmentalized. So GP per man day or crew day would be the comparison to, say, multiplier markup or divisor. Um, I'm not a divisor multiplier markup guy, as right. you know. Right. Um, I've been an evangelist against it. Mm -hmm. um, I teach the methods, though. I want people to understand the strengths and weaknesses of why. You know, it's not. It's one thing for me to say, don't do it. You know, it's like telling my kids, don't touch the hot stove. All three of them did. You know, <laughs> what? why did you do that? Well, we, we had to figure it out for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so divisor, multiplier, and markup for me are like that. Um, it's a profitable model on a one-day job. Uh, but we, what, what happens is we look at overhead in that relationship as a percentage. And overhead is not a percentage. We don't right. pay our bills with percentages. The second problem is it treats material and equipment uh, the same as it treats labor. Um, so they, it treats the, the relationship of the divisor method or multiplier is those are equal in terms of the relationship of the job. And they are not. Right. Labor drives overhead in a contracting business. And I always tell the story that I had 72 rooftop units in one day. Uh, my overhead per day was $1,200. It was an $850,000 job. The margin on it was 20%, which is not a great margin percentage. So by divisor, multiplier, markup standards, you would say, well, that's not very good except 20% is 160,000 gross profit dollars <laughs> against $1,200 of overhead. Right. Where do I sign up for that job every day, right, Ben? I mean, let's right. go get some Absolutely. of those. 
that's a high material, low labor job. So uh, gross profit dollars per man day would, would look at that completely differently than divisor. So um, conversely, if you did 72 rooftop units individually one day at a time, you would have had 72 overhead days times $1,200. So you would have been much closer to 95 or $96,000 of overhead versus 1200. So not as profitable a job. Divisor would have treated that exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. And so we're not, it's not an effective approach. So what we try to do is get contractors to recognize that that was a great method in the 70s and 80s when we were dealing with every duct system was done correctly. Uh, builders weren't, you know, building homes with flex duct and we weren't repairing airflow and we didn't have, you know, standards in California that require hers rating type right. things and extra labor is tied to that job and that's across the united states now ben so as we move through especially sear 2 we're talking about new refrigerant changes we're talking about hers rating systems across the board that's changing the way our contracting businesses are are doing our our contract work so more labor uh less equipment you talked about raising costs mm -hmm. in terms of the manufacturing. Well, you guys didn't show up one day and say, well, let's raise prices 30%. Everybody did because right. of logistics. So that actually creates a real harmful pricing effect if you're using a straight line divisor method. If you're using GP per man day, you can take a high cost piece of equipment and your overhead hasn't changed. It doesn't matter if it's a 28 sear or a 18 sear. Or, it doesn't matter what it is, right? Dual fuel heat pumps. The cost associated with equipment is not the driving relationship on what the price point is. It's your gross profit number. And so the contractors can actually do more installation work and still make more money without necessarily having to raise their prices sky high. So I think it's just a conversation that we have with business owners about, well, why are you doing it the way you're doing it? Is it a comfort zone? You're used to doing it that way? Or do you really understand the metrics and how to actually scale the business? So it's it's not a, you have to do it this way. Mm -hmm. It's more or less you and I need to figure out how to train people to look at what's in their best interests. Yeah, and what I have found is the contractors that have taken the methodology that you've taught are actually a lot more competitive in their marketplace against all of their other competitors that haven't quite figured out. Uh, and, and so they have more jobs. And yes. as you have more jobs, actually that burden on that particular job goes down. Yes. And so they become even more and more competitive while everybody else becomes less and less competitive. Precisely. And I think we can we can talk about that in, in two phases. So mm -hmm. phase one is price is relevant. So in summertime, you know, in Phoenix, the price of an air conditioner should be at the highest price point that you Absolutely. would sell at. So it's not that we would want to necessarily lower price or be competitive. But then the second phase is shoulder season. I literally, on the way in to the podcast to come visit with you today, uh, spent some time with a contractor in Carolina, and there's nothing on their job board. They're mm. literally naked on their job board. So they've had nothing going on for 10 days. And so my question was, well, what are you doing with promotions? What are you doing with your product positioning? What are you doing to market to customers that, you know, don't necessarily need something today, but might be in the planned purchase model? And their answer was nothing. And I'm like, well, that's why you need to understand the, the gross profit dollars per man day because the high efficiency product is uh, we have the ability to flex. Mm -hmm. This is one of those opportunities where I can say, well, hey, if you want a great system, you want a dike and fit, let's get you into it. We've got a 15-year financing program. It's $145 a month. You're going to save more money than you're going to spend. Why wouldn't you want to do that? Plus, we'll give you an extended warranty, blah, 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 right? So not understanding the promotions and the pricing schematic together is the problem inside of that particular business. I would say that that's a gross profit dollar per man day um, win. Uh, you know, when we talk about pricing, that's the reason why we want to be able to do that. We need people to understand departmentalization, KPIs, pricing strategy. So that's an entire conversation. So I'm pretty sure you guys got some classes on that, don't you? <laughs> we do. <laughs> you know, the one thing I would be interested with, because I have been talking pricing with contractors for many years, just like you have. And one of the exercises I love to do is, here's your cost, here's your materials, here's your labor. Yep. Go ahead, everybody in the room, figure out the pricing. Yep. And if I have 30 people in the class, I get 30 different prices. Sometimes and, 32 <laughs> or 35, right? right? <laughs> but I, if I list them all up in numerical order and I point to something in the middle and I say, okay, somebody picked this price, raise your hand, who, who, whose price was this? Mm -hmm. All right, tell me about everybody that was higher than you. Oh, they're ripping the customer off. Tell me about everybody that's lower than you. Well, they're giving the job away because obviously their magic formula was the right price. Right. What do you say to the contractor that says, 
I'm afraid, you know, I got into this because I want to help people. I don't want to rip customers off. How, how do you, what do you say to that contractor? Yeah, I, that's a real fear. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I think if you do that in a room, you'll get that exact response. You'll get all those numbers and you'll get that concern. And, and sometimes it's a large portion of that audience mm-hmm. that will be concerned about that. So to me, pricing is relevant. Um, I can't be successful at supporting my community and be aggressive at things that I do in the community, like donating back, mm-hmm. unless the company actually prospers. When, as I prosper, I can then decide what I want to do with that prosperity. So that's number one. So pricing yourself where you lose money and go out of business, who are you helping? You're certainly not helping yourself or your family, and you certainly can't help the community. And all those employees that you have that have families, you didn't help them either. So I think the second part of that conversation is you need a budget to determine, hey, what's my profit target? What, what What do I need to do here in my replacement business to make the kind of money that allows me to support my employees, pay, benefits, training, development, personal development, community work, all that stuff. That costs money. So uh, I was watching Shark Tank last night. Yeah. I don't know if you were watching it last night, but these, these guys that were on there, they were three really super nice guys, and they were, they were all about saving the planet, saving the community, but they weren't making any money, and the sharks were all over them. They're like, guys, you have to make money to be productive at saving your community. Without you making money, your business doesn't exist. Right. So how are you going to help the community if you cease to exist? And uh, one of the sharks is like, you're going out of business. Like, you need to change your mindset. Uh, Not the helpfulness Mm -hmm. mindset, but that profit is not a bad motive. So I think when we talk to the the owners there, we ask, well, what's a reasonable profit? And most of them won't, they'll they'll be too low. So 15% EBIT, earnings before interest and taxes, would be the minimum threshold. Because I still have to pay the federal government. I have to pay my state government. You know, Texas might want a little bit of that money, Right. And so I pay a 5% franchise tax on EPC equity. So whatever I build out of revenue, that's 5% goes away. That's tax. So it, it, you know, they don't care whether I make a profit or not. So, but I have to pull that out of profit. That's where I get the money from. Mm -hmm. So the company has to produce at least 15, Ben. And if we're not, then we're probably not going to sustain periods like we're in right now where interest rates are high. Sales are probably down on the installation side, fewer conversions and service becomes the primary mechanism. So I think the third answer to that is, what are you worth? Like, what are you worth? Like, why are you undervaluing yourself? You're doing a great job. You have great warranties, great technology. You're, you're very good at your work. Um, Gary has spent 40 years trying to be better at HVAC than I was yesterday. Mm-hmm. So you wouldn't pay me in a consulting gig because of what I bring to the table on a part you would pay me for my failures and my knowledge and experience to keep you away from making those mistakes that I made, right? That's what you're yeah, paying absolutely. me for is the wisdom that, you know, for the 40 years. What's the value in that? And that there's a value attached to that. Um, so people like Ruth King are just amazing. You know, she's running around teaching people, hey, you've got to know your cost. You've got to be able to price correctly. So when you, when you decide 15% EBIT or 20% EBIT, uh, that's going to get you to a number, and your budget should also be a, a, attached to that. And so most contractors don't do budgets. I think you probably would agree right. with that. I don't know what your personal experience is. But if you don't have a budget, you don't know where you're spending your money, and you don't have the ability to create a price. And so I think all, of those, all three of those things play into it. So you, you mentioned employees. I think ever since I've gotten into this industry now over 25 years ago, uh, I have heard that uh, you know, it's hard finding employees. And I think maybe it's gotten progressively worse over time uh, for a, a myriad of reasons. But uh, you talked about compensating employees. Yeah. You know, this is something I talk to a lot of contractors about. I'd love to get your take just on, you know, is there a cap to compensating an employee? Is there this magic number where an employee should be? Is there something that's too low? You know, how do you, you figure out where the comp plan, and the comp's not just paycheck, right? It's also all the benefits that you include with that. So. You bet. You bet. Yeah, it's a, it, it is a problem. You know, the human resource side of the mm-hmm. business, just finding the talent and the labor to actually do the physical workflow is the challenge. I don't have a problem finding people from my agencies, people that are coming out of college or looking for jobs, people that are trades related. That's definitely uh, a, a barrier. So mm-hmm. I think recruiting and development is kind of key. So I'll, I'll start off that uh, conversation with culture. 
uh, Trump's strategy. To, uh, basically, I, I think Drucker also said it is culture mm -hmm. eats strategy for breakfast. Right, right. And it does. So if you have bad culture, it doesn't matter what I'm paying. I mean, even if I'm paying you an amazing amount of money, if I have terrible culture, you're probably not going to stick around. So I think a business owner has to think about how do we create a really great culture of prosperity. Then from a pure compensation point of view, I'm going to talk about rewards. Rewards includes money, but it also includes recognition, affirmation, support, development, you know, nurturing, uh, sometimes, you know, kicking somebody in the rear and saying, mm -hmm. you, you know, how, how people are motivated is relevant. So we have to understand our people. So sometimes I can be tough on somebody, other times maybe not so much. And I need, I need to be a nurturer. So as a business leader, I think you got to figure your people out. Um, then as we pay people with rewards, I have a real specific philosophy on that. Um, so I have a profit sharing platform, um, which is based in principle that there is no cap on your compensation, Ben. Hmm. So if my company does better, your bonuses are coming to you. So you, you're, you're not capped. Uh, so phase one would be, hey, you're paid hourly or salary and you're going to get a wage. And that's to produce a certain set of activities. The second layer of that is you're going to be bonused on KPIs. Every single position in every company I have has KPIs. And so you're going to be tied to your KPIs. Uh, so if Gary's over here and he's goofing around and he's not making his numbers, you're not penalized for that. Right. You're directly related to your personal responsibility to deliver your KPIs. The third layer of that is you are a part of a team component, which is there's going to be a group if you're in the service group or if you're in the install group or you're in the plumbing group, sewer and drain, commercial plumbing. You're going to get paid a certain percentage over the gross profit dollars. So we have a bonus number. It's based on the idea that, okay, if you're going to make a million dollars of gross profit, Ben, and we do a million two in that department for gross profit, that whole unit will share 25% of that increment. Hmm. So the, the $200,000 gain for the company, uh, you know, money's coming back. $50,000 is coming back to you as part of that team. And then the overall profit sharing is the fourth layer of that, which is everybody in the company gets that no matter who they are, no matter what, no matter how poorly you perform, you still are going to get profit. Uh, back to you if the company has hit its targets. So our relationship with compensation is, is money related, but it starts with culture. Um, the second layer is employee development, um, the ability to look at an individual and say, hey, I care more about you uh, than, your, than about the money or the performance. Like you're more important to me than just how you produce. And then the third layer of that is the compensation of money has to be there. People will leave your company if you're underpaying them. It's you know, so we're going to be competitive, and I like to think that we overpay our people. I don't mind that at all, as long as the company is producing. I'm, I love that. I want you to make as much money as possible. Now, there's a last conversation to that which I have, which I invest in my people in terms of their personal achievement plans. Mm -hmm. Like I demand that every single employee that works in any of my companies has a personal goal setting achievement plan, which has nothing to do with my business. But it has everything to do with your personal well-being. Are you sleeping? Are you eating? Are you in health? Are you mentally well, you know, organized? Are you, you know, having mental health challenges? Or are you in a good place? You know, are you investing your money? Do you understand pay yourself first? So that you as a human being are doing things that are contributing to your family and your community, not just the growth of my business. And so I find that people really kind of respect that idea. Like they, sure. they get it that we care about them as human beings, not just as somebody that's, you know, trying to produce something for the business. So Daikin has some interesting uh, goals that they've set. Speaking of goals, we've yeah. got five big key initiatives that we've put out this year. And so the first one, you know, we're looking at Daikin Cloud Services and we're looking at our goal of 500,000 fit units that we want to sell. Uh, there's our R32 adoption that we're looking at. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got our uh, RAQA, which is our ductless product that uh, we've been pushing, then refrigerant uh, reclamation and mm -hmm. making sure that we recycle 100% of all the refrigerant that comes out of this facility. Right. And so, you know, we've put those big goals out there as a, as a corporation. As an HVAC contractor and somebody that sells Daikin, uh, if we start off with uh, the cloud services, how have you seen that impact your business? And, and how, how do you see that impacting kind of the industry as it goes forward? Where do you see that monitoring uh, going? Yeah, it's in its infancy right yeah. now. Um, and as an industry, we're technically slow to adopt new technologies and things mm -hmm. along those lines. I mean, historically, we have been. I, I'm not sure that that's true going forward. But to me, cloud is going to be where we end up. 
Now, how soon we get there, Ben, I, I'll probably be long retired by the time this happens, but I think where we're going with it is, is precisely where we need to go with it, which is the contractor needs to embed that into their services to mm -hmm. say, um, like on my systems in my home, um, I need somebody to remotely monitor that. So if I travel or if I'm at work uh, and something is going on, the cloud system, you know, it gives the contractor the ability to understand, okay, there's an issue going on at the Alex property mm -hmm. and identify what that issue is. So I think the forward thinking side of that is what is that issue so the technician can actually have the right parts and the inventory management systems are going to be just much way better than what we are today. We send a tech out today to a non-cloud-based system and we figure it out. Well, I think with AI and cloud together, that collaboration, I think you guys will probably lead the way. And eventually, that's where everybody will be. So my business will be offering you a club agreement and saying part of my relationship with you value added at the contractor level is I'm going to have a monitoring system for you. It's going to keep an eye on your systems, whether you're here or not. And I'll be able to alert you ahead of time if there's an issue. So I think that's 100% what will happen. Um, the manufacturer's been working on this a long time now, so we've, we've got the tech to do it. Um, with 5G, with other technologies mm -hmm. that are coming in, you know, that are converging, it, it reminds me of where we were in 2007. I, I wasn't in the agency business, Ben. I was a contractor, and my website sucked, and I, and I had no traction, and I was just whining about it. And I had a business partner that was in the web business. It was a different business partner, yeah. so a whole different separate <clears throat> entity. And at the time, I'm just complaining, and he's like, well, your, your website does, it is terrible. So we need to fix it. And so we did. But what we didn't know was the iPhone was coming out. Right. Okay. Our smartphones. Everybody had a BlackBerry back in those times. So the iPhone changed the way people did searches. So most of the searches today, over 65% of them were done on mobile phones. Well, in 2007, everything was done on desktop. So now we build responsive sites, the convergence of the technologies. The marketing process is a completely different animal than it was starting in 2007. So I look at the cloud services today as we're in 2007, and as people are starting to invent you know, better technologies and cloud becomes the platform that you would use to communicate and touch, with, touch your customers, I think contractors that are not doing that are going to be on the outside looking in. Um, contractors that are doing it are probably going to find out that they're going to, people like me are going to want that service. People like you are going to want that service. Uh, Gen Z, Gen Y, millennials, they're technology driven. They're going to want that service. So the demographics are changing in favor of that. Uh, there's no stopping it. It's a tidal wave. It's just one of those things that's out there a little bit in the distance. And uh, if you're not, if you're not going to be surfing the wave, you're probably going to get pummeled by it. Uh, and one of the other aspects to cloud that we really do see is the the labor saving point of it. Yep. Because now I don't need to roll a truck. Yep. What can I fix just through the internet? And so I can go in there, mm -hmm. I can change settings on a piece of equipment, yep. I can run an update real quick. You know, if Dykin comes up with a new way to manage humidity control in a house, that can automatically be updated on every single system out there exactly. without anybody else going out there. I'd like to make a comment on this too. My wife loves your app. <laughs> like it's it, like there's a lot of apps out there now, yeah. right? And so her, she's passionate about your app. She loves it. And so I think that's super important because the app is consumer related and that's a touch point. It's a brand experience, right? And she comments all the time. She goes, I love that app. I love this app. She's like, why can't everybody else build an app like that? So credit to the team that did that. But that's all tied into that relationship with the cloud. So if the app works, that's probably your angle of how to actually get customers to engage. So next goal is uh, Fit 500. We want to sell 500,000 Daikin Fit units by yeah. 2025. And, uh, you know, we're, we're moving towards that. Uh, how does that impact you as a contractor? Well, it doesn't impact me at all because I'm a fit guy. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so, um, we're, we're all about it. I think the contractors that are successful today right now in the Daikin DCP platforms, they are very focused on the fit. Um, I personally will put the fit in a position two through five um, in my world 
position one is going to be low end. Mm -hmm. Position seven is going to be something crazy. Right. Um, so somewhere in the middle, the positioning strategy. And I, so I say two through five because two will be promotional. Mm -hmm. It's not normally there. But today, right now in October in Carolina, it would be a promotional item. It would be $145 a month. So why wouldn't you buy the fit? So we've discounted that fit to a price point that makes it kind of silly for a homeowner not to want that product. In the peak season, it's really going to be probably position four or five. It's going to be in the middle on the higher end of the middle, and we're going to promote that. So I think teaching contractors gross profit dollar per man day and understanding promotions and shoulder seasons is how you guys will get to 500000 and and maybe beyond that. So it's it's a pricing promotion and positioning strategy conversation. Mm -hmm. And most contractors really don't use those three in combination uh, well. Sure. Uh, there are some that do, of course, but uh, you guys are probably out talking about that too, right? I we think. are. We have some programs coming up right now uh, with our uh, Goodman side discharge launch that we've got going on. And okay. so, yeah, we're talking about good. the three Ps. Good, good. Yeah, so I, I think you'll achieve that objective without too much problem. So I don't want to make a commitment for you here. So the sales guys are probably over there squirming right now. <laughs> But do you see yourself, uh, does it differentiate you as a contractor when you've oh, got yeah. one of the other brands that somebody comes in and says, hey, we can do this for you? It, do you see that as a differentiator? Yeah. So uh, two things. The contractor should see the fit as a differentiating technology. The, but the truth is, is that the relationship with the Daikin group, the team, also differentiates that. I have a lot of trust in, you know, if I need training, my guys need to know how to sell it installation service, um, that entire channel works for me. So it's not, so I can sell myself as a contractor and you'll have a lot of contractors out there that are gonna, they're gonna want that philosophy. Uh, but to me, it's a tie in with the brand. So I'm stronger by selling the Daikin Fit and I don't really necessarily have to worry about what's gonna happen behind it. So yes, I agree with that. And uh, there's gonna be knockoffs though. Mm. You, you and I both know sure. that, uh, you know, in our history in HVAC plumbing too, Somebody will build the next version of it or some, you know, a, a different manufacturer will come up with their, their element. So first in wins though, typically. So, and so you're there. And so I think, you know, as you drive the relationship with your contractors, you'll, you'll probably sell more than those 500,000. So switching over to refrigerants, uh, we got two of the strategies. One is a refrigerant mm -hmm. reclamation mm -hmm. as a, as a contractor, you know, how important is that to you as a business? Uh, when I, when we look at the industry statistics, less than 10% of all of the refrigerant produced today actually comes back uh, and is recycled. So how important is that recycling and uh, reclaiming of refrigerant to you? It, for me personally, it's yeah. very important. But I have a probably an opinion about you know the environment and yeah. what we're doing and HCFCs that are different than other people. So... Um, we're at a place where we probably have to make a decision about how we're going to treat the planet and how we're going to treat each yeah. other. So I, I don't like that 10% number. I think that it needs to be much higher. Um, so the Montreal Accords and some of the protocols that we're, we're seeing and just the, the AIM mm -hmm. Act uh, is designed to be able to support, you know, more reclaim, uh, but also, you know, changing the refrigerant to something that doesn't have the high impact, you know, uh, global warming properties, the GWPs. So I, I think it's the right thing to do. I think the industry is not well positioned at the moment. So I think Daikin is. I think the, probably the manufacturers in general um, are looking at it and saying, how do we get the contractors to recognize the importance of that? It's an easy conversation for me. My, my demographics and my businesses are about not just the product, but about being responsible to the community, being responsible to the environment, being responsible to everybody else on the planet let's make sure that we're reclaiming the refrigerant that we have. So if we're selling R32 in a new product, what are we going to do with the old refrigerant, whether that's 410 or, you know, we still see R22 out there. Um, we, we need to be responsible human beings, responsible business people. And that's something that's part of our core values. So I just, I'm just not sure how to influence the other 80,000 contractors <laughs> out there, Ben. I, if you could wave the magic wand, right. we could do it. But um, it's coming to them by law. Like there, there's the mandates are coming, so I think we'll make some progress just because there's mandates. Uh, but there's always going to be people out there that just they're just not going to participate, and so that's a different problem. 
I think it's always come down to the enforcement of those mandates, and it unfortunately, it's a difficult thing to enforce. So one of the things, though, we have done, and uh, we're going to be putting this out on our website, and we're going to be talking to contractors all over the country, is we've put a pledge for R32, just kind of to what you're talking about. And some of the things that are, I'm not going to read the whole thing, obviously, but some of the things in here, mm -hmm. we talk about the global warming potential and the reducing the, uh, the global warming potential, energy efficiency, being able to make equipment more uh, efficient so it uses less electricity, the safety that R32 has yep. uh, by being, you know, it's been out there since 2012. And we see that, uh, you know, there have not been any cases of inj injury related to R32 being in people's homes. It's available. It's a commodity. Um, but we're asking contractors to commit to promoting R32 education, mm -hmm. making sure that their people are uh, educated, uh, that they're pri prioritizing the R32 adoption, mm -hmm. uh, that they're advocating for R32. They're looking to reduce their emissions and collaborate and innovate. And so as we just started this pledge, you came in here, yep. and you're going to be the very first contractor the to go today. ahead and sign this right here for right. us. I so love that. I, I appreciate you doing that for us and, and putting that on there. But uh, for all of those that are watching the Accelerate HVAC Success Program, I would uh, encourage you uh, to go to the HVAC Learning Campus, sign our pledge, talk to your territory sales manager, and uh, we'll make sure that you get on there and you get recognized for that. Beautiful. Uh, thank you so much, Gary. I get to be the first one. I <laughs> you love <do>. that. You <laughs> do. And uh, you live in infamy. <laughs> I love that. I love that. So, yeah, I, I think the contractors need to pay attention to what's actually mm -hmm. happening to the refrigerant changeover, too. And I, I feel like it's out of sight, out of mind for a lot of contractors, Ben. And uh, so anything I can do to help you guys promote the awareness, the, the business logic, um, you guys have plenty of technical people that can talk through the, the technical side of it, uh, but I'm happy to support you guys because I think we need to make sure that contractors are not caught off guard with the changeover, and some of them will be. That's going to be a problem financially for them. It's going to, it's going to impact them. One other top of mind thing, and I think you've got some opinions on this, private equity. Yeah. Uh, that's a, a big topic in our industry today. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you lived through kind of a consolidation that our industry went through, and, and that had its uh, unique challenges. Where do you see private equity going? That's a, a loaded question, <laughs> <laughs> seeing as how I am in that space. Right. But I'm also, I'm not really a guy that's going to go public mm -hmm. with my businesses. Like, that's not my intention. So we don't, we don't acquire an interest in a business to take it public. Um, now, I'm not going to say that we haven't flipped companies because we have eventually sold. But normally, for me, it's been you're in an HVAC business and you want to grow and you need an exit strategy. When, when you exit, what do you want and at what point do you want? Do you want that to be with your kids? Do you want a succession plan? You know, you want to sell it to somebody else? Um, so that's, that's where I play in that space. I'm a sliver. Um, there's scaled private equity firms we're, we're talking about you know large large blocks of money mm -hmm. um so i think it has a runway and i don't think it's going to end well that's just my personal opinion on that if i had to gun to head talk about what happens i don't think the private equity firms are going to be able to operate and manage the same way that the local operator and independent entrepreneur does um we wrestled the alligator in the 1990s, mm -hmm. and we learned a lot. We, we learned a ton. Uh, in fact, a lot of what I do now came from the mistakes that we made. Like, hey, that was, a, we thought it was a great idea, but it turned out to not be a great idea because we couldn't, we couldn't make it work. The functionality right. wasn't there. Um, so I think we're already seeing it. We're already seeing some of the failures of the private equity groups where the owners have run through their earnouts. And so if I take Ben out of this business, he was too important to that business, his energy, his passion, his willingness to get up at 5 a.m. and stay till 10 p.m. and sacrifice in order to make sure that the culture in the business was performing at the highest level. Uh, his customer experience was done right. When we remove you, the next person in doesn't have that same energy and passion. That doesn't mean there aren't business processes and analytics, but what I've seen is most of the private equity groups are numbers driven only. They're not looking at the culture and the people. And eventually there's an erosion that occurs there. So 
Um, what happened in the 90s was a lot of those companies went back into the market and got bought back by the original owners or there was an opportunity for other people to step in and buy the, buy the brand. Um, so, but I do think there's probably a couple of people out there that will make it. Um, I'm not going to name names, but you and I privately probably can put yeah. it on a piece of paper and we probably agree on that because they're very sophisticated about the people side of the business and they're not necessarily looking to go public and flip, you know, and make a lot of money. Um, so when money is the motivating factor, I think decisions are different than when culture is the motivating, fa motivating factor. And so I think the private equity groups that look at culture and look at serving the customer, I think they'll survive and they'll make it. And uh, we may see a national brand at some point. Uh, nobody's accomplished that yet. I think that's on a couple of people's lists. Um, it was on my list in the 90s. That's why I signed <laughs> right. on. Right, I, I right. signed on to be able to do that. And, uh, you know, that was a failure in my career that I look back on and say, I wish we would have done it. We could have. Uh, we made a lot of dumb mistakes, uh, but, but we had the ability to do it. We had 245 center operations at the time, and that's bigger than anybody today, uh, not revenue-wise, but in terms of pins on the right. map. Um, so I think, I think somebody will probably get there at some point. Um, maybe it takes the right kind of leadership that isn't necessarily focused on the money side. So, um, uh, but PE is not going away and there's, they're going to keep buying because home services produces a lot of free cash flow, and you have to put your money somewhere and you can't just own buildings in San Francisco or New York city as right. your exclusive investment. Um, so the PE teams, you know, they they understand that there's a good return on capital here. Well, Gary, I really appreciate you coming in here. It's Do been you have pleasure. any last words of wisdom that you want to give to our audience? I uh, want to thank Daikin. want to thank the industry. The industry has given me everything I have economically, so uh, it's been terrific. It's been an amazing ride for me. Um, as you know, I like to try to give back to the trades. Mm -hmm. So at this point, to me, it's just uh, any opportunity I can to help you, help the people that are in the industry. Um, I just I want people to be able to call on me and reach out, and I'm um, happy to help out. So I appreciate you. the invite. So for all of you out there, if you like this episode, please go ahead and like it. And then also please go ahead and follow us so you can see all of the upcoming episodes that we have coming. Gary, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure, Ben. And really we look forward it. to seeing you here again soon. Yep. Thank you again. All right, I thank appreciate you. the invite. Take care.